Justice and its absence are today a history-making issue. It was justice that set America ablaze in 2020 when Pink Floyd was stepped on by a bright police officer. Hmm? Oh, by a white police officer. And guess who invented that blaze setting justice? Justice is a thread that runs through the entire course of ancient Greek history, philosophy, and literature, from earliest beginning to last melancholy end. It is justice that Greek cities seek in their politics, and an absence of justice that leads the Greeks to turn away from their city, some of them to the point of wandering homelessness. But it's not only judicial justice that the ancient Greeks invented, it was a much larger concept, one which they believed ruled the entire universe, naturally and inevitably. So to explore our second ancient audacity and what happened to it in the course of Hellas's five splendid centuries, we go back to mythology and to Hesiod, the second oldest poet in Western literature. <clears throat> Hesiod writes about half a century after Homer, and he writes two poems, The Works and Days and The Theogony. His Theogony gives a kind of creation myth and a divine family tree. In the beginning was chaos, then the earth and the sky gave birth to the Titans, the youngest of whom was Kronos. Kronos raped his sister, and she gave birth to Hestia, Demeter, Hera, Hades, Poseidon, and lastly, Zeus. Zeus then led a rebellion against the Titans. He wins, and he fathers Athena, Persephone, Apollo and Artemis, Ares, and Hephaestus. These are the twelve Olympian gods, Zeus, his five brothers and sisters, and his six children. Then Zeus marries Themis, the titanic organizer of communities, and she bears him the hours, order, peace, and... which means justice. It is not pronounced dyke, coincidentally, but dike. And Hesiod's first mention of dike, of the goddess justice, introduces us quickly to a second juicy new concept. Listen to justice and do not foster hubris, for hubris is bad for a poor man, and even the wealthy cannot easily bear its burden. Hubris is the only ancient Greek sin. The Greeks did not consider sex to be sinful, though I do, it is gross, nor overeating to be a sin, nor anger. But hubris was the one sin, and was always followed by the severest of punishments, for hubris was to the Greeks not simple arrogance, but a denial of our dependence on the gods. And in Hesiod, hubris is in conflict with Dike. As a word, Dike originates from the boundaries which demarcated a man's land, those which to cross was to trespass. So implicitly, Dike is the setting of limits upon the actions of individuals. When we cross those limits, when we dare beyond men's daring, we have committed hubris. The goddess Dike flies up to her father and sings to him of our wickedness, to punish which Zeus sends famine, plague, and ruin, and not merely upon the wicked, but on the whole city of which he is a citizen. The community is punished, says Hesiod, for the unjust actions of individuals, and across half centuries too, for false speaking in one generation leaves the following in obscurity. This idea is then echoed and amplified by Solon, the first Athenian poet whose name we know about 150 years after Hesiod. Solon is also the Athenian Abe Lincoln. Did you say Abe Lincoln? No, I say Abe Lincoln. I said, hey, Lincoln, hold the reins, man. And in his poetry, justice reappears abundantly. Our city will not perish by the decree of Zeus and the counsel of the immortal gods. But the citizens themselves, in their folly, persist in destroying it, obedient to greed. Driven by avarice, the unjust leaders of the people enrich themselves unrighteously and do not preserve the holy foundations of Dike, who in silence knows all the past and all the present, but does not fail to come in time to punish. Greek justice. This is the first piece of outright political advice ever and it implies that the ruin of a city is not externally brought, but internally wrought by greed 
and by injustice. Dike becomes now the process by which injustices are inevitably compensated for over time. Slow time brings justice in its train, said Solon, and that train is as natural as the weather. As the strength of snow and of hail is from a cloud, and thunder comes of bright lightning, a city is destroyed by great men, and the people from ignorance fall into slavery under a monarch. Solon and the early ancient Greeks lived by this idea of natural justice and divine equilibrium. They believed in a kind of citywide ecosystem of justice. But that ecosystem soon gets even larger. In early philosophy, Anaximandros, Anaximander, hypothesized that the entire universe was ruled by the reciprocal debts owed between justice and injustice. Heraclitus, Heraclitus, said that justice even ruled the course of the sun and would punish it for deviating. So justice is a divine principle, a divine moral principle, the divine moral principle and one that the very first tragedian, Aeschylus, tells us accomplishes matters visibly. That is, 5th century Greeks expected to see the retributive power of justice on earth and in their own lifetimes. Forty years later, Sophocles warns Athens of a backlash against the rewarding of irreverence, advantage unfairly gained, unholy deeds, and lack of a fear of justice. If such deeds are held in honor, why should we join in the sacred dance? asks Sophocles. And at the same time, Euripides was half pleading and half pointing out that tyranny kills so many men and steals their possessions and men break their oaths by sacking cities. But those who do such things are more fortunate than those who live each day piously and at peace. Justice slowly began to disappear from Hellas. Come the Macedonian kings who dispense personal justice and who smash all previous limits to human endeavor by declaring themselves kings of Asia and invading India, what then happens to the Greek mind when justice ceases to be visible in this life? Sure, we might no longer see the proper rewards given to the proper recipients, nor the correct punishments given to those who deserve them, but that doesn't mean that they won't get punished in a... Wait, does it? Might I be rewarded for my goodness in a, in another, another what? Another life? What, after this one? What are you fucking nuts? The afterlife and its relation to an absence of DK is a little too complex for a 10 minute video and is explored in a new cavalier introduction to ancient Greece. But after Alexander, whose death ends our semester, you have rising rent, you have rising food costs, and you have unaccountable careerists waging constant wars and trampling on all dissent. Sound familiar? But there is a history of Greek justice, our second ancient audacity, a natural justice that punishes greed, that punishes the trespassing of humans into the sphere of the divine, punishes the disruption of peaceful equilibrium, a justice that is as natural and powerful as a storm that is inevitable and which sometimes takes generations to manifest itself. So I leave you with these thoughts. When you shut down entire economies for a flu and give people money for nothing, do you think that that unnaturally enormous interruption might eventually have to be paid for? With inflation, perhaps. When you make police officers beat up old women because they disagree with you, would you be surprised if people stopped enrolling as your police officers? All Solon is saying is that when you outsource all your manufacturing and import all your necessities from brainwashed communist racists, might you eventually have to reckon with these deferments? And when you destroy exponentially the earth that gives you life, mightn't that destruction one day need to be compensated for in equal measures of death? You can see in the New Cavalier Reading Society's Ancient Greece semester how the Greeks in the face of an increasing absence of justice, turn to a belief in an afterlife where justice would ultimately be served. But I wonder what we, unable to believe in an afterlife, will turn to in order to compensate for the increasing absence of justice in our world and in our time. But such are the laws of our second ancient audacity, Greek justice, Dike, who is as natural as the sea, who does not fail to come in time, 
and who inclines her scale so that wisdom comes at the price of suffering.